my name is Cliff Tour, and welcome to Zoomed In and Candid Comments video channel. Today, I'm joined by a great physicist and, of course, a, uh, a wonderful podcaster I've listened to for a long time. It is called Daniel and Jorge Explain the Universe. I'm speaking, of course, about Daniel Whiteson, a physical uh, uh, person in the uh, physical world who does physics for a living at UC uh, Ir Irvine. And he's joining me today to talk about something that I think is really, really important uh, because it's a buzz in the uh, in the community out in just about every field of work, including my work, which is in call centers. And of course, I'm speaking about AI. Daniel, thank you very much for taking time out to, uh, to join us today. Thanks very much for having you for having me. And I can confirm that I am actually a physical person and not a generative AI. Well, there we go. That's that's an important thing to start off with. So we know that the rise of the machines has not happened um, and AI has not taken over the world. So that's a good thing. Um, now, I read on your profile that you use machine learning in what you do. Can you explain how you use it? Sure. Yeah. Machine learning is a very broad term and people use it for all sorts of things from distinguishing cats and dogs in Internet videos to analyzing other kinds of data. And in particle physics, we're interested in answering questions like, what is the smallest bit? And how do those bits interact? And what is the universe made out of? Uh, to do that, we smash particles together with a large Hadron Collider. So protons collide at nearly the speed of light. And sometimes, very rarely, like every trillion collisions or so, something new and weird is made. A new heavy particle, uh, some new rare interaction happens, and we get this spray of some something new that comes out of our detectors. The reason that we need machine learning is that we can never see these things directly. It's not like you see a Higgs boson, you're like, oh, look, there's a Higgs boson. I can tell the way you might like find a unicorn in the forest. Unicorns are difficult to find, but once you find one, you're pretty sure you have it. In our case, we never see the Higgs boson or the new particles directly. We only see the splash they leave in our detectors. So we have a difficult statistical problem of saying, well, we saw this splash in our detectors. Is it a Higgs boson or is it not? And that turns out to be very similar to the problem of like, is this a cat in the internet video or is it a dog or is it just a bunch of random pixels? So machine learning can learn to recognize the patterns that Higgs bosons or other particles leave in our detectors and help us find those among the trillions and trillions of boring collisions that don't teach us anything about the universe. Oh, that's that's uh, so I'd say an important part of what you do in physics, particularly in particle physics. So because particles are so minute and small, you can't, as you pointed out, you can't see them, uh, but they're there. I mean, that's what makes us up is particles. Uh, so uh, that that said, though, the question behind machine learning, though, is that um, we're talking about something that is AI generated. Is it, is that the correct statement? Well, machine learning is a part of AI, right? It's a, it's a kind of AI. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you can just think of it as like fancy statistics. It's just like ways to learn patterns. If you don't know how to describe the patterns in advance, then you can learn them. Like if you knew already what cats looked like, we just look for cats. But if you didn't know what cats looked like and somebody gave you a bunch of examples and said, here's a bunch of cats, here's a bunch of not cats, can you figure out the difference? Then you learn those patterns. So machine learning is not really, you know, artificial intelligence most generally. We're not like training something to think and compete with us. We're just training basically calculational tools to learn patterns in our data. Um, so that's an important part of AI, but it's not really artificial intelligence most broadly. It's really just fancy pattern matching uh, in, in the case of particle physics. So where does actually AI now sit within physics itself, and particularly in your in your field of physics with particle um, uh, with particles and dealing with them? So mm -hmm. how is AI interacting uh, with that or intersecting with it? Yeah, well, the, in lots of ways because AI is a very broad field. You know, one way that it's interacting with us is we now rely heavily on these machine learning tools to help us analyze our data, and people are concerned, I don't know, worried that maybe the AI, the machine learning is doing things that we don't understand. Like if it looks at some collision and it says there's a Higgs boson here, how do we know that it knows what it's talking about? 
Can we understand how it decided to do that? You know, you can look at a picture of a cat and say, yeah, I agree, it's a cat. But if it's an edge case, you're not quite sure, but your machine learning is telling you this really is a cat or this really is a Higgs boson. How do you have faith in it? Um, and so we want to understand what the machine is learning. Because in the end, science is something that humans are doing. We're asking questions. We want to know the answers to questions. We don't just want to hook machine learning up to our data source and tell it to write a bunch of papers that other machine learning algorithms will read, right? Science is of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that means humans. So we need to make sure that whatever machine learning is doing is interpretable, is still answering uh, physics questions in a language that makes sense to humans. And that's a real challenge as machine learning gets more powerful and we get more and more distant from the low level data itself that we can look at and understand and say, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, it'd be a shame if uh, machine learning fooled us into thinking that uh, this particle exists or that particle doesn't exist. So that's a lot of discussion right now in particle physics is how do we make sure that whatever the machine has learned is something that makes sense to humans. Yeah, and that, I think that's the real debate is the question is, is this uh, thing that we've developed AI actually accurate? Is it telling us the truth? I mean, there's been a problem with chat GPT, for example, not offering accurate data back to the peer, people that are putting it in because as it goes and scrubs the internet and just finds everything and chews it all in to its um, memory banks, it basically can spit out things that are not accurate. Uh, so that's definitely a con. What what would you say are some of the pros and cons in general with respect to AI and in particular in the sciences like yours? Yeah, well, I, would, I wouldn't say that uh, it's a problem or an issue with ChatGPT generating nonsense. I think that's sort of what it's designed to do. I think it's surprising that anybody expects it would do anything else. Remember that generative models like large language models are not designed to reason and think and develop hypotheses the way humans do. They're designed to generate text which resembles the text on which they're trained. And so it generates confident looking stuff. You try to talk to ChatGPT about physics, it will generate confident looking text, you know, like the text that it finds online. That doesn't mean it has any meaning to it at all. It has no insight, no physics to it at all. I've tried, I've talked to ChatGPT, GPT 3.5, whatever about this stuff. And it's very confident and you probe it very gently and it just all falls apart. It's not, it's a nonsense generator. It gener it's trained to generate nonsense that looks like the things it was trained on. It's not trained to understand about physics or science or have any insight whatsoever. So I'm always perplexed that people are at all surprised that it generates nonsense because <laughs> that's what it's for. Um, so it, it's generating gobbledygook and it's intended to do that. Yeah, exactly. It's like a, It's like an image generator, you know? If you if you have AI that's and you want to generate an image of a cat riding a bicycle um, wearing a suit, then it can do that, right? And it's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll look for this kind of thing and I'll generate something similar. It doesn't come back and say, hold on, cats can't ride bicycles. Cats don't wear suits. This isn't. I'm not going to do that because that's not consistent with the world as I understand it. it doesn't understand the world. It doesn't think about the world. It doesn't care. It just generates stuff. So if you say like, hey, write me a paper about how you know, muons are actually tiny little unicorns dancing in the forest of the universe, it'll do that. And it'll be total nonsense. The same way that cats riding bicycles wearing suits is, is nonsense. It's fantastical. Now, it's awesome. It's impressive. I, I'm blown away by the capacity of chat GPT to generate, you know, fluent language that looks like the kind of thing people might write. That's mm -hmm. very impressive, but it's not doing science at all. And it's not useful for doing science. I've tried to use ChatGPT to like summarize papers. Say, so take this paper, summarize it for me. Then I read the paper myself and compare it to the summary. It's not a useful replacement for an expert reading the paper. It gets it wrong. It makes mistakes. It references things that don't exist. It's, it's silly. But that wasn't what your question. Your question was the role of AI in physics more generally. And I'd say that it's finding a lot of very useful applications as long as you know wh what to use it for and you understand its capacity and its limitations. 
You know, we're very good right now at generating machine learning or AI tools that can solve specific problems. Generalized intelligence is, you know, it's far, far in the future. But as an example, we can do more than just use machine learning to um, analyze data. We can also use machine learning to generate synthetic data, which is actually very, very helpful. Uh, one of the things we need to do when we analyze our data is compare it to the kind of data we expect. Like if you say, all right, how do you know if you have a Higgs boson in your data? Do you know what the Higgs boson would look like if it happened, if it occurred, if it was created in your collisions? So to do that, we have we generate synthetic data. We have programs that run and simulate what would happen if a Higgs boson was created and what it would look like in our detectors. And that's great, but those programs are very, very slow. They're very complicated. So one huge advance we've made recently is training artificial intelligence to generate that data more rapidly. So instead of saying, AI, give me a picture of a cat riding a bicycle, you say, AI, give me an example of what Higgs bosons might look like in our detector. And it's very, very good at that. That's excellent. It doesn't care if the Higgs boson exists in reality or not, it will generate an example for you very quickly. So we've trained these things to be very fast synthetic data generators, which is a crucial part of the way that we explore hypotheses. So that's become very powerful in particle physics recently. Hmm, that's, <clears throat> so it does sound like there's some, uh, besides the goblet group, there is some actual practical use for AI at the, at the moment. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I, um, I've heard that a lot of people are saying we're really still not as in control of it as we should be. Would you agree with that? Or are we Are we still, at the learning stage with AI, where, where are we at at this point, would you think? I think we're definitely in the early stages. And I think every five years, we'll look back and see the previous five years as very primitive, uh, the kind of things that we could do. Uh, it's evolving very rapidly. Um, and for a couple of reasons. One is that our ability to do computing is evolving rapidly. You know, on the hardware side, like the capacity to do faster calculations, GPUs and XPUs and all sorts of, of fancy PUs are just giving us more computing power. And a lot of these problems are just limited by how much computing power do you have? How much um, can you crank on these problems and learn hard problems? Because, uh, you know, there's big data sets. You want to learn from the whole internet? That in, The whole internet is big, man. It takes a lot it's of huge, computing yeah. power. Yeah. So on one hand, we just have faster computers, which will make our AI smarter. Um, on the other hand, we're also being more efficient with it. A lot of recent progress in AI is learning to learn faster. Instead of needing to train for a year on a huge data set, can you learn basically the same thing in a day or in a week? And so we are more rapidly generating AI models that can do what the models did uh, after a year's training in just a day. So that's supercharging everything. And so I think things are accelerating. Um, so we will definitely have more powerful AI tomorrow and next week and next year. Um, whether we're losing control of it, I don't think that's a, really a concern in the sense of like that people think about in like Terminator style. Mm, I don't yeah. think the AI is going to decide to turn off the Large Hadron Collider or build robots to kill us. Uh, you know, it has no interest in this. It has no interest at all. It just follows instructions, you know. Uh, I'm not worried that my toaster is trying to kill me, even though it could. <laughs> <You know, laughs> electric. Well, you stick a fork in it; it will definitely yeah, do that. Exactly. I mean, we can we can just unplug the computers at any point, and they're no longer dangerous. I do think that there's a danger in losing sight of their goal of machine learning, and you know, we're not interested again in just turning science over to the machine and saying, "Do it." For, I'm going to lunch, analyze the data, and write a paper. Right. Science is still done by people. And we want to ask questions that we want to know the answers to and get answers that make sense to us. So we don't want bots writing papers read by other bots in language only bots speak. That's not science. That's, you know, that's, I don't I know what that is. Yeah. And I think that's some of the general concern is because when you have bots speaking to bots and all that, they develop their own language. And the scientists looking at all this will go, uh oh, what happened here? How come this is going on? Why are we seeing all this? And it just kind of creeps people out because it's like, oh, that's when you get that machine rising theory. You know, all of a sudden Arnold Schwarzenegger is coming out and it's like, I'll be back. 
Mm -hmm. you know, with all that kind of thing. And I think that's what kind of scares people. Should we be scared of AI or how do we want to, as a general society, uh, look at it? And what, if anything, is the existential risk with AI? Well, I'm not an expert in AI existential risk, but it's not something that I lose sleep over really at all. I think, frankly, we're much more likely to kill ourselves uh, before AI is powerful enough to, to cause any danger at all. You know, climate change, war, political divisions, we have much more urgent things to worry about. You know, I have kids who are teenagers that are entering the world, and I think about the state of the world in 10 years and in 30 years when they'll potentially be parents. And AI is not near the top of my list of things that I lose sleep over. You know, it's it's climate change and it's uh, it's political violence and it's, uh, you know, instability in, in a broader political sense on the world that, that worries me. I think that AI, fears about AI are fun to read about in science fiction, but I think really very remote. All right, excellent. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to come out and, and discuss this because I think it's an important thing. And somebody like yourself, who not only is um, uh, a, a physicist, but also a, a person who's now in the media with your your podcast, uh, Daniel and Jorge Explain the Universe, you, you do have a lot of caveat here. And I, I appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to do this. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you to discuss this or any other topics, how would they go about contacting Daniel Whiteson? Yeah, I'm very easy to find. Just Google me. You find my website. You see my email address. It's daniel at uci.edu. That's UC Irvine. Uh, I answer all my emails. If you have a question about physics or whatever, write to me and uh, I'll write back to you. Very happy as a professor at a public institution to make myself accessible to the public to answer questions if I have anything to say about them. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me on. It's always fun to talk about these topics. Yeah, it's been it's been a blast, and I'll get this up on our uh, our site. And also for people wanting to know, I've actually had the pleasure of doing written ones on our other uh, channel, which is one on one blog, uh, one on one candid conversations. Blogspot.com. There are two articles that are on there that I uh, had a conversation with Daniel about uh, his book uh, with respect to uh, what he's done, and also his podcast. So you can see that. I'll link it into this particular conversation. And Daniel, again, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. Take care.